Yeah. How many children do you have? I just have one son, and he has three kids, and two of his boys have kids. So I'm a great grandfather. Yeah. Wow. How old yeah. are you? Can I ask? 61. 61? Yeah. When did you get started? <laughs> uh, real young. I was in high school. Yeah. I, I got my girlfriend pregnant in high school. So I'm only 16 years older than my son. Wow. He's 45. Huh. And he started young as well. So I was 16 when he was born. He was 17 when his first son was born. And then Robert was 18 when his daughter was born. So my oldest uh, great granddaughter is nine already. Yeah. You could make it to great, great. I could, easily. Yeah. Easily, yeah. Stay healthy. I hope so. I mean, <laughs> but we have that other element in the family, you know, that self-destructive thing. Welcome to Friends with Deficits. I'm your host, Adam Sultan. My next friend is Bodhi Prahoda. I normally give a bit of an introduction, but I think for this episode, I'm going to let Bodhi speak for himself. It's a long story with quite a few turns, so we've made it a two-parter. I hope you get a chance to finish the story by listening to the second half, which will be coming out very soon. Now, let's get down to business. You want to get down to business? Yeah. <laughs> where, where, where are you from? I'm from Wisconsin. Born in a small town uh, upstate Wisconsin. Don't remember any of it or next to nothing of it. Little kid when we moved to Milwaukee. Large family. My mother had uh, 12 kids. Three of them died very young. Childbirth or something. Shortly after, probably. Growing up in, in poverty. I don't think we were ever on welfare. But I remember like government cheese and food stamps and stuff like that, I think, as a kid. you know. But we were always you know, pretty well fed. We just raggedy clothes and we were like the dirty little kids of the neighborhood, you know. Mother was a housewife. My father worked in a factory, a foundry. And, and dad was a, a really hard working guy, but he, he was a functional alcoholic. He he got drunk every night, but he went to work every day. Did you know he was an alcoholic? Not at the time, I didn't. I didn't know what that meant, but I just thought that was normal, you know, yeah. that he, he took care of his, his, his thing. The funny thing is that both of my parents were really nice people. They're kind, sweet, likable people, but they just weren't good parents. And I've talked to a number of my siblings since we've become adults about, they said the same thing. No discipline, no, no direction. My mom used to do my homework for me. I thought that was great. That sounds nice. You did, <laughs> you did at the time. <laughs> I mean, my parents never encouraged anything. Just, they were just there. Were you all pretty independent? Because there's so many of you, it seems yes, like. Yes, yes. And that's one of the things that, that seems to be a, a benefit. You know, a couple of them were in jail, too. My brother, in particular, he went to prison also, my older brother. But most of them, as adults, became very independent. So there's maybe some strength that came out of that. I don't know if you'd call it that. I had a sister that was a couple of years older than me. And my sister... Very sharp girl, very witty person with a lot of personality. And she, to excuse the term, had big balls. Not, it seemed like nothing scared that girl. And um, I think she got me into crime at a very young age, shoplifting and stuff like that, you know. I, and she could lie her way out of just about anything. And I, was, I think I was a pretty timid individual at a young age, but I got confidence from her. We were very close. You know, sneak out of the house in the middle of the night, We'd put a ladder up against the, hmm. the wall and climb out on the top porch and down the ladder and terrorizing <laughs> the neighborhood, you know. How old were you? I, I'd say, you know, eight, nine, ten years old in that area. She took me on some adventures, no doubt. And then she got locked up. I must have been 12, so she'd have been 14 or 15. She got sent to a state girls' school. By then I, was, I had some confidence of my own. I had an older sister that was always um, looking out for us. And most of us really resented her as kids because, you know, who, who is she to tell us what to do? We didn't have any parental guidance. We love that. And then we got this big sister bossing us around, you know. And she died a couple of years ago, but I was able to, to thank her many, many times for doing that, for being there. Not only for us, but for our parents. She's the only one of the kids that ever really looked out for our parents. You know, she had a good heart. 
But yeah, so run in the streets a lot. And it really, it's shocking. When I think back, 9, 10, 11 years old, I could be gone all day. Nobody asked me where I was. My nine-year-old great-granddaughter, I could not imagine that. It's scary. Yeah. You know. My I older so. brother, yeah, I wanted to be like him because he was like the cool guy. You know, he dressed sharp and he stayed out late and he, he had cars. And I think he went to prison, I think, for like burglary and forgery. So by the time I got to be in my late teens, he was, he was already straightening up. He had started his own construction company. He still does that today, him and his kids. And he turned, he, he turned his life around. He be, I think he became an alcoholic too, though, but he, he stopped doing crime in his early 20s, and that's when I was really getting into it. Like every other year or so, I'd get arrested for something. And most people who, who know that world, they can read between the lines. They can see the progression. I just wasn't getting caught. What about, you said you had a child at 16? I did. Yeah. So did that change anything? No, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> How did you relate to having a kid or raising a kid? It, it was it was sort of like, you know, it was a badge of honor. You know, I was banging this girl and it's like, ooh, you know, we got it going on now. But I had really very little to do with raising him. And uh, is the mother, are you, are you still in, are you in touch? Yeah, she actually lives here now too. Uh, we're not together. We haven't been in a long, long time. But she visited me in prison for years and brought my son to visit me as well. So I had some relationship with him, but I was not a good influence on him as a young kid. Are you close to him now? Closer? Yes, and but I'm distancing myself from him. I am. I'm sorry to say because my son at 45 years old, he's still he's a gang member and a wannabe drug dealer. And he got two kids who are into drugs, and he, he doesn't seem to, to accept any responsibility for that. Yeah, it's pretty sad. My son is really a good guy in a lot of ways, but he really bit into the gangster thing. It, it, it's kind of bizarre, really, Adam, because the world I came from, we tried to keep our mouth shut about things. My son cannot keep his mouth shut. He's got to have his thing out there. He refuses to go unnoticed. Yeah, so it's frustrating, and at the same time, I don't know if there's anything I can do about it. So in my late teens, I'm, uh, I'm basically a thief and a low-level drug dealer, right? But I don't, I don't have a job, and I don't... Uh, Are you living at home? No. no. I was on the run. I was like, seemed like most of my life I was on the run from something, you know? But I was on escape from the, the juvenile boys' school. You know, made enough money as a criminal to just a party. You know, really, that's what it was. Slept here, slept there, wherever, you know, sleazy women, quick drugs, whatever the thing was, the party life, right? And um, there's a guy, he's like two years older than me. He was a fun person to be around, but he was also a, criminally, he was a very aggressive person. And I thought, that's how I want to be. Because I was really, I wasn't an aggressive person. I was kind of a sweetheart type, but I wanted to be. I thought that's how you got ahead in the world, by being aggressive. So I had been like partners in crime with this guy for about two years. So maybe from 16 to 18. He had a driver's license and a car and I didn't. So that was part of the attraction too. We had wheels now. We could go all over the place, right? And he took me to a different level. Oh, a number of times in that two years, I'd get locked up or I'd have to leave town because something happened. You know, I have to go stay with a relative somewhere else in the state or something like that. So that happened a number of times where I would come back to Milwaukee and the crew is different. I'm gone for six months or whatever. And I come back and some of the same people are there. There's some new people, right? So like the, the little den of thieves changes. So when I come back in the summer of 75, my, my friend Pat, excuse me, Pat, he's hanging around with these two guys. We've both known them for years, but didn't know them well. Bobby is the older brother of a real good friend of ours, and, and Brian is his friend. 
these are guys that we grew up underneath as teenagers, and we saw them as gangsters, and we're just little wannabes. And when I come back in the summer of 75, Pat's with those guys. Ooh, now we're to, we got it going on. You know, these guys are serious about their thing. So I know these guys for years, but didn't know them. I had no idea of what they were capable of. I don't know that they did either. I don't know that they knew they were capable of murder. So Bobby's the oldest, he's like five years older than me. Then Brian is like three years older than me. Pat's two years older than me. I just turned 18 in July. This happened in August. We're at a bar one night, the usual hangout where we spend our Saturday nights. And I come in there and it's, it's just Pat and Bobby. Pat, I got, I got something set up. We're gonna go take this place down. Okay, whatever, you know, we go over there and look at it. This is a cocktail lounge. It's called Bryant's Cocktail Lounge, south side of Milwaukee. <laughs> this place is crowded. There's people all over the place. And I'm like, Pat, there's no way, no way I'm gonna be involved in that. Have you done anything like this before? Yeah, we had, we had. So we're talking armed robbery? Armed robbery, yes, yes. So what made this different than other times? Okay. Well, the girl, his Pat's girlfriend is driving the car. She's 17 years old. We, we all know how to drive. We don't need to drive her. You know, something was weird there, but I didn't know at the time what, what that was about. So 11.30, midnight or so, I'm not sure. But we go back to the, the hangout, the bar that we hung out in, and Brian's in there. And Pat recruits Brian also. So now there's four of us. And we go back there again, an hour later, it's 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning. Most of those people are gone. It's not crowded like it was. And we decided to go in there and rob it. That night? That night. That was early morning hours. So you, plan, you came up with this plan that, the night that you he executed? Did. He did. And when you find out why, I didn't know this till months later what happened, but that 17-year-old girl turned state's evidence against us. She testified that her and her boyfriend, Pat, they had been in there earlier that day and he was refused service because he wasn't dressed properly. This is kind of an upscale place. He wasn't dressed properly. He got a bug up his ass because he was embarrassed in front of his girlfriend. Now, we didn't know that till we went to trial. Was that her story, or did you think that's no, what that's actually true. happened? No, that's true. That's okay. true. But Pat's one of those aggressive types. You don't challenge him. He gets to do whatever he wants to. And he's a dangerous guy. He still is to this day. He's a very, pretty dangerous guy. Is he in prison? Is he out? Actually, they let him out, too. Me and him are the only ones that got out. So what actually happened? Well, first, let me back up, because you said this wasn't your first time no. doing that. No. It, it was new. It was that, that, that summer. That, that stuff like that yeah. started happening because guns were not a part of my program. I always made money being a thief and a low-level drug dealer, but when I got with those guys... Did you ever use your gun before that? No. I, never, I didn't have a gun on this one. Were you the only one who didn't have a gun? I was the only one who didn't have a gun. However, people testified that I had a gun. There's, this is a split-level cocktail lounge. There's a lower level and upstairs another level. So, so we go in there and... Like I said, Pat had this worked out already. Me and Bobby are going to go upstairs, and, and Brian and Pat are going to be downstairs, okay? We, we were robbing the upstairs bar, Bobby and I were, and we're, 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 I don't think we're in there two or three minutes. And pop, 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 a whole lot of gunfire downstairs. So ran downstairs. I see people laying all over. I thought they're all shot or something. I don't know what happened. I'm the first one. I go through this door, and when I push this door open, there's somebody laying on the sidewalk with a gun pointed at me. I can't say for sure, but I believe he shot at me, and I ducked back in. That's when Bobby, the guy that was upstairs with me, came past me and, and exchanged fire with him. Bobby shot him eight times, and Pat shot him twice indoors but oh so we don't know all all the details until we go to trial at the trial they've had months six months or so to look through all the evidence you got eyewitness testimony which can vary dramatically the physical evidence does not there was three different guns used in this and all three of them were different calibers 
which is very fortunate mm -hmm. in that it's, it's clear to see who did what. And the eyewitness testimony also suggested that the off-duty policeman opened fire. Four people shot all together, including the police officer. So the person shooting at you guys was a cop? Off-duty police officer. Off police. He was an off yes, he opened fire. He never gave any warning that he was a police officer. He opened fire. And initially, we were charged with his death, with the armed robbery, and two counts of attempted murder, initially. But by the time we get to trial, they know those two patrons of the bar were shot by the police officer. He opened fire, he shot Pat once, he shot one of the patrons once, and he shot one of them twice. And it's hard to talk about that. I don't want to sound like I'm putting blame on him. I don't think that was standard police procedure to start a gunfire in a, in a crowded room. Um, I'm sure it was not. Back to the, the story. I, so I push the door open, I see him outside the door, I duck back in, Bobby goes out, pop, 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 shoots him eight times. And then here comes Brian and Pat. Pat's been shot in the stomach. Brian's got him on one side, and I grab him on the other side, and we go through the door. And as soon as we get outside that front door, there's police outside. I think they had, a, I'm sure they had a silent alarm. They triggered the alarm. Those, those officers testified, they were like a block away when they got that call. They were already out there waiting for us to come out the door. Another gunfight ensues. Bobby runs across the street and police officer had a shotgun. He shot, Bobby went down in between the two parked cars. I thought he was shot, but I think he just slipped on the gravel. When the, the, the shooting started outside, I got Pat on one side, Brian's got him on the other side. All the three, three of us drop and I turn this way and run through this yard. I ran this way, Bobby ran that way. Pat, Pat got shot again outside by another a police officer, and he and Brian got caught right there. Bobby, Bobby and I got away, we got arrested hours later. The robbery probably happened at two o'clock in the morning. By three o'clock or so, we were at Bobby's girlfriend's house, and she had something to do with them finding us. He must have told her what happened, and she drove by the crime scene, and the police took down her plates and followed her home or something like that. And that's where we were. We were arrested like four or five, six o'clock in the morning, just a couple of hours after the, the crime. And then what? Little beatings and <laughs> interrogation and the police changed shifts around 6 a.m. So we got arrested by the shift going off duty and we got punched up and stuff by the shift coming on duty. Did you try to deny it? I did, I gave a, a false statement claiming that I was here and there and I had done other things and uh, that came back to haunt me at trial because that wasn't true and they could prove that. And oddly enough, these tough guys that I thought I looked up for to, they made statements against me. I didn't make statements against them. I thought that was that honor among thieves thing, you know, that, but it didn't work out like that. Pat was shot twice, so he was hospitalized for a week or so. But Bobby and I were both taken to the hospital for x-rays and stuff because of the beatings that we took from the police. That was their reaction to our taking down one of their, their brothers. Pat and I both had charges in other counties. And I was I was probably in the, in the Milwaukee County Jail for maybe a month. I was on a a different case in Dane County, that's Madison, Wisconsin. So after a month in the, in the county jail, they sent, sent me back to Dane County to face those charges. And that judge sentenced me to three years in prison. So I went right to prison. For right. a different robbery. A different robbery, yeah. Not, a, not an armed robbery, that was a strong arm robbery, I guess you'd call it. So I, I go to prison on that case. Pat has other robbery charges in a different county. A month or two after I get to prison, he comes to prison. So he and I are already in state prison, and the other two guys are in the county jail. And then we went to trial in probably end of February, beginning of March. 
and it was a sequestered jury. I think it was a 14-day trial. And I'd say 99% of that was prosecution introducing massive evidence against us. We had no defense. However, by the time we, we get ready to go to trial, our attorneys know what the evidence says. The evidence says that Bobby and Pat did the shooting. My attorney and Brian's attorney both say, we plead guilty to the armed robbery, but not to the murder because the evidence says these guys did, committed the murder. You guys clearly didn't. So we do that. We, en we enter guilty pleas, Brian and I do. By pleading guilty to armed robbery, we also pled guilty to the murder, unknowingly. That there's a statute that says when you, you, have, you have multiple offenses that come out of the same episode, by pleading guilty to the lesser the offense, you automatically plead guilty to the, the greater offense. So we all go to trial together, we're all found guilty, and we're all given maximum terms on all counts. Life plus 70 years life for the homicide, and 70 years for two counts of robbery, armed and masked robbery. So that was a part of our appeal, is that we didn't have an adequate defense because our, our attorneys pled us guilty to homicide. Hi, it's Adam again. I have a small appeal for you all, not to take the words out of my guest's mouth, but in order to put them in your ears, it takes a bit of work. You may notice there are no commercials on the show, and the reason that's possible is because of the generosity of my patrons and friends who have offered a small monthly or one-time donation at patreon.com slash friendswithdeficits. So here's my plea, and it's a bargain. Check out patreon.com slash friendswithdeficits, even to just watch a fun video or just see what else is brewing around there, and decide if you're interested in helping out in being a partner in crime to Friends with Deficits. Thanks a lot. And now let's get back to Bodhi's story. So Brian and I got together and we worked together in the, the prison gym, gymnasium. And that's when we saw um, a flaw in the, in the security and decided to take advantage of it. And so months of planning, I'd say at least six months or so, trying different things. And Is this like the classic movie, like busting through a brick wall with a toothpick no. for years or <laughs> No, this is a maximum security prison. You know what a sally port is? No. Okay, it's kind of like a lock or, or a channel that boats go through. We have to open one gate, you move in there. There's no water, obviously, so there's two gates in the prison. You open the outside gate, the truck or the car, whatever, drives in, they close that gate, then they can open the other gate and you can get inside the prison. Right. That way nobody can just run out of the, out of the gate, right? So. The front of the prison, on this side over here, there's a tower right on the corner. That tower can see the front of the prison. On the Sally Port side, the tower is on the inside. He can't see. He's blocked. He's got a partially blocked view of this one side of the building. That's where we cut the bars. In broad daylight, too. Saw, saw it through the bars. Wow. With hacksaw blades. So the bottom level is security. And the top level is where part of the gymnasium is. The, gym, the, the, the basketball court over here, and then there's bleachers and stuff yeah. on this side. They would show movies in there and stuff like that. So we hid in the gym until they lock up. They lock, they, they close up around 4.30ish. And everybody's sent back to the cell halls. And then there's, they ring out for chow. They, they ring out for, for supper. And then they have what they call a six o'clock count. But it's usually before six. Whenever they get ready, when everybody's back in, it could be 10-2, it could be 5-2, but they call it the 6 o'clock count. Brian and I dropped out of that window about 10 minutes to 6 because we, we hid in the gym at 4.30. They, over, they didn't see us. You know, we were well hidden. All the inmates are gone. Staff take their shower and they leave. That's when we come out. We could hear them. And this is when you saw you saw through the bars of the windows. Yes, after they left, we took turns. Where did you get the saws? Friends. Wow. Yeah, friends with benefits. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So, so uh, we had a guy, a friend of ours too, in in the metal shop or something, made a holder. We had four hacksaw blades. You can't you can't get one arm 
through those bars. So we got to cut two of them. And I would go as long as I could go, and then he would go as hard as he could go. It took us a good hour to make those four cuts. Had our sheets already tied up and went down three stories down the side of that building. And like I said, if that guard was paying attention, he's probably eating or something. He still would have seen us when we came out, but he didn't. And the prison was uh, a maximum security prison. Everybody wore khakis, except that front yard crew. They wore blue jeans, blue shirts, you know, and, and blue jeans. And this, is, this prison is right in a residential area. So all these neighbors know, you know, what the prisoners look like. So even if we had blues, or khakis, they would have known right away. However, th the prison also, um, they have industries. Some prisons make license plates, some prisons make road signs. This particular prison did laundry for all the other institutions. Again, friends would find us jogging suits from these other prisons. We had to have a different clothing. So we did, we had jogging suits. We dropped down that thing. That guard would have had maybe 40, 50 feet span there where he would have had it. He would have seen us. There was like a long driveway, like a horseshoe shaped driveway in front of the prison. A lot of tall trees and stuff like that. And we just had our jogging suits on and we went jogging down the road. Yeah. Did you have connections outside? We did. We had a friend waiting for us. Yeah. She was parked a, a couple blocks away in a car and big old Impala or something like that. And you should see in her eyes when she seen us come around the corner. So she popped the trunk and we both jumped into the trunk and, and drove off. That sounds so thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, Adam. It was like the nervous giggles. You wouldn't believe it. So we stayed in the trunk until at least dark. That was like six o'clock and the brown maybe nine or 10 o'clock, I got out of the trunk and rode with her because they're looking for two men. They got a girl and a guy. Um, and she drove us to the Twin Cities. We had some money, she gave us some money or something like that. And then we were on our own. We're kind of surprised that we got away with this, you know. We hope when we get away, but we didn't really have a plan. After a day or two in, in the Twin Cities, we decided to go to Denver. Neither of us ever been to Denver. We don't know nothing about Denver, right? Got a, a room at a little flea bag hotel, Hotel California, we called it, because <laughs> it was the Pierce Hotel on California Street. And uh, we stayed there for, I don't know, a month or two. And then we met some people and started, got jobs and stuff. And worked for like a, a temp agency. Did you need to provide ID or did you have fake ID? We, we, yeah, we had fake stuff. You know, we knew about that sort of thing. There's there's some books. Have you ever heard of the paper trip? Mm -mm. You still get that book online. It tells you how to do that stuff, how to create <laughs> false identities. I even got a passport. Wow. I went to Australia years later. Uh, okay, so anyway, we're in Denver. Uh, we start meeting people, but we're, we're back to selling drugs. We're not thieving. We're not carrying guns or anything like that, but that's like our element. And we were back in the sleazy bars with the sleazy girls and the... That lifestyle, right away, we're right back into that. But we have jobs that we got through that temp agency. The temp agency would send you to different places, and eventually we both landed a job at the same place. Were you nervous at that point about getting caught? Yes and no, but you know, we were drinking a lot of beer. Like, there's, there's some of that, but probably not as much as there should have been. Yeah. You know, because we're enjoying it. So that's the summer of 77. So maybe around October or November, I'm at work one day, and Brian calls me. He says, I got arrested. He, he, he was drunk. He got arrested for drunk and disorderly. And the police took him to downtown and, and fingerprinted him, but let him go. Fingerprints take time, especially then. Wow, we got to get out of town. And we did. I quit my job that day. Had to make up a an excuse to get my check because they don't usually won't give you your check unless you get fired. They gave me my check and we were, we left Denver the next morning, went to Salt Lake City, stayed there for a couple of weeks. Uh, you ever been to Salt Lake City? They don't sell alcohol. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, two weeks. So we, we work in a lot of temp agencies there too, or a number of them. But after two weeks, like this ain't, this ain't for us. This is Mormon country, you know. Mm -hmm. 
and it showed. So that wasn't going to work. And then we drove to Portland, Oregon. Portland was good. We liked it there. And same thing, we got jobs, but right into that life again, the drugs and the bars and the this and that and the other. Brian gets, gets arrested again. Same thing. I think drunk driving this time. He doesn't even have a driver's license. They take him to jail, they fingerprint him, and let him go. Again, we got a high tail out of town the next day. And then he quit drinking because he recognized that, that that was a problem. Um, so we weren't, we weren't there that long, maybe two or three months in Portland. We go to San Francisco, Oakland. We stayed there for a couple of weeks. So then we ended up in Phoenix for a little while. And then we drove through Texas and then Louisiana, and Alabama, Mississippi to Florida. And we're only in Florida for a couple of weeks. We both get arrested for trespassing. We were looking to steal something, but we didn't actually steal something. We get arrested for trespassing, and then they don't believe our story. So we're being charged with trespassing and attempted theft or something in Jacksonville, Florida. So we go into the court for like a bail hearing or something, and the, the, the prosecutor tells the judge that there is some question as to these men's identity. Ooh. Okay, so he write, puts a higher bond on us, and we don't have the money. It's like 800 bucks or something. It's 77, that's a lot of money. We don't have it. I, I'm thinking, oh, what to do, what to do? Because time's running out. The fingerprints are going to come back eventually. Eventually, I figured a thing. I, I think it was like a crisis center or something that I called a crisis center to tell them that to get in contact with some of my relatives. I couldn't call them directly from like the jail. The, the, FBI was probably watching their phones, but somebody through the crisis center contacted family members in Wisconsin. And my sister, Pat, the one who, with the big balls, her boyfriend at the time flew to Jacksonville, Florida and bailed me out. So Brian gets caught then. I get bailed out. My sister's boyfriend, Kenny, flew to Jacksonville to bail me out. And then we drove to probably Atlanta, where he got back on a plane and took off, and I went to Nashville. You're really jet-setting in this mm. adventure here. I did, I moved around a lot, yeah. I wouldn't call it jet-setting. No. It's more like running scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you do get to see a lot of our beautiful country. I did, yes, I did. I saw a lot of our country, yeah. yes. Okay, so I'm in Nashville, and I'm on my own. I'm only 20 years old, then. I got a job on a, a construction gig. You know, you know what an iron worker is? A what? A structural iron worker. The, the, the structure of a building, mm -hmm. steel beams, uh -huh. stuff like that. And I'm, I'm starting off, I'm just a laborer. But I'm a hardworking guy, and eventually I get to a better position. In it. But mostly I got to a position where I knew enough to fake it on the next job. Because I wasn't a journeyman, I was just an apprentice. Iron workers move around a lot. They're all over. You go where the job is. So I, I meet this Indian guy. He tells me about a job in Oklahoma. So we went to Oklahoma, me and the Indian guy, we got jobs. Now, now I'm lying, you know, I'm faking it through as a, as a journeyman, so I'm getting top dollar to work. Stayed there, for, I don't know, four or five months again, same thing, right back in the bars and uh, mostly weed, not a lot of other stuff besides that, but it's like self-medication type of thing. He went off somewhere and then I came to Texas. There's a, a, a nuclear power plant that they were building just outside of Bay City. And that's where I met Michael. Michael Miller was AWOL from the Navy. We're both, you know, criminally minded people, him and I. Again, mostly selling drugs. And he's telling me about Australia. And uh, you can't stop talking about Australia. And to be, be perfectly honest with you, I thought Australia was Austria. In Europe. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. So I didn't know. I thought he's a... so. Eventually, I learned about it. We left Bay City, Texas, and we went to probably Phoenix, Arizona. I stayed there two, three different times on escape. Same thing: drugs and uh, drinking and uh, messing around. And Michael is—he knows I'm wanted, but he doesn't know why. I mean, who would believe that story, mm -hmm. right? Till one day he comes home 
And he's got it right there. He, he was in the post office and he saw my picture. Oh, shit. Now I'm scared because I didn't know they had that. It's like, I kind of forgot about this stuff, you know? I've been out for probably two years at the time and I wasn't thinking about that. And now, you're know, like, who else saw that picture? You know, I'm glad he took it down and nobody saw him in the post office taking my picture down. I think shortly after that, things, like, I don't know if I just couldn't trust him or what the thing was, but there was kind of a, a rift between him and me. We ended up in Los Angeles and uh, I already have a passport under his brother's name because he provided the information, the, birth, the information that I needed for the birth certificate and other things. So I got a driver's license and whatever. And I send off and get a passport to go to Australia. Well, Michael doesn't get a passport. He doesn't follow through the information that I told him how to do this. And he was going off to like meet some Navy buddies of his in San Diego. And I'm supposed to meet him in like a week or so. And I knew that would never happen. I just, I can't trust this guy anymore. You know, he knows my thing. He saw my picture. He's too loose with the mouth. He's too unreliable. He lies too much. And I got, bought a ticket to Sydney, Australia. In a day or two, I was gone. There's this weird thing that you see this in the movies a lot, or at least I did. You know, you got big heat on you from the police, you gotta get out of the country. There's something that people overlook about getting out of the country, and that is, as soon as you open your mouth, they know you're a foreigner. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. didn't occur to me, right? So everybody knows. I'm... So I was not blending at all <laughs> in Australia. And Australia is very, um, people are very blunt. They're very likable people. They treated me very well, but initially you couldn't tell. Because they will, they're, they're very coarse people, a lot of profanity, and, and they drink. Oh my God, they drink. And I even got to the point where I'm, I'm, I felt really bad. I was getting drunk twice a day. I was. I, yeah. I know. And that was, a, that, I remember walking down the street crying one night, like, what the fuck is happening to me? You know? I'm just really getting sucked into this world. So I think I quit for a while with drinking. And then I um, started thinking about coming back. I was going to stand out in Australia, and and it was harder to get a job there because I was a, stru a, a structural iron worker. Well, faking it as a, a journeyman iron worker, I could get good jobs here in the states. Over there, no, they're not going to give an American a top job. You know, give it to the Aussies first. So I did come back in like March of '80. Came back and uh, I, I moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. Never been there before. I don't know anybody. I contacted Kenny. That's my sister Pat's boyfriend. That's where I made the mistake. So I used to do that all the time. Like I would call family, mostly Pat, my sister Pat. But I, I would do it like from a truck stop in the middle of a major intersection. And they had no idea where I was going or where I was coming from. And I didn't do that. I slipped up and... uh they traced that call, and they knew where I was in Alba, at my house in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Did they have a tap on Pat's phone? Yeah, yeah. Probably not a tap where they listen, but they they get alerts. You know, some a deal they probably have with like the phone company. Any suspicious activity on this line, we want to know about it. It's like uh, I don't know, maybe Monday morning, around ten. 11 o'clock in the morning, I'd been out late that night, the usual, drinking, smoking, and whatever. I'm just laying in bed thinking about something or another, and I hear cars pulling up and tires screeching and doors slamming. I'm like, what the, what is that, you know? And I get up and look out the window, oh my God. You know, the bulletproof vests and the, the shotgun, and they are heavy. There's probably 30 of them out there. It was FBI, I, I learned this later, FBI, local police and sheriffs, they all come come down on me at the same, you know, together. And uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning, that sun is, in May, that sun is bright. I'm in a dark house. I do not want them coming in here because I'm going get, to get shot. So I get up, put, put, I think that's all I did is put a pair of pants on. I don't have shoes, a shirt or anything. I just got a pair of pants. That's all I have on. 
and I walk to the curtains. When I open the curtains, I'm like face to face with one of these law enforcement. Ooh, we scare each other. <laughs> and he starts shouting at me, put your hands on your head and open, you know, open the door and walk out with your hands behind your head. Mm -hmm. And I do that. Mm -hmm. This is probably the easiest arrest they ever made. I bet it didn't take them eight seconds to mm -hmm. arrest me because I really didn't want to get shot. I spent two or three months in Albuquerque fighting extradition, which was futile. There was no way. So hoping for another chance to escape, I guess, mm -hmm. you know, looking at other options. And then in July or August, I went back to Wisconsin to uh, face those charges again. Looking forward to the rest of the story? Stay tuned for part two. And thank you for listening. If you'd like to sign up for our newsletter or peruse other episodes, you can always check out our website, friendswithdeficitspodcast.com. And if you'd like to support the show and get exclusive access to outtakes and other goodies, check out patreon.com slash friends with deficits. I'm Adam Sultan. Stay out of trouble.